please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hello and a warm welcome to a very special exclusive. Now, over the last couple of months, any conversation surrounding industry in Tamil Nadu has resonated with just one name, and that's Sterlite Copper. Now, this is largely because of an incident that occurred, of course, on May 22nd, where 13 protesters in the district of Tutikoran were fired upon and killed for protesting an extension or an expansion of the Sterlite Copper plant, which, of course, is located within the district. But the real story, remember, goes back two decades when Sterlite Copper was established in the state of Tamil Nadu and was ever since facing a number of violations, allegations of environmental violations and the like. Now, joining us to discuss all, of course, that has transpired in the last couple of months and the last couple of decades is Mr. P. Ramnath, CEO of Sterlite Industries. Hi. Good to have you, sir. Thanks, Jude. You know, there are two stories here, really. One, of course, is that all that's occurred in the last couple of months, like I mentioned, you know, since the 22nd of May. But there's another side of the story, one that goes back 22 years. Now, we'll come to the incident, of course, in just a bit, but I have to ask you, for the last couple of decades since you have existed in the state of Tamil Nadu, have operated the copper plant itself, there have been several allegations with regard to violations that you may have committed, largely on the environmental front, as a, sub as a consequence of which on the health front. And you at Sterlite Copper have gone about denying each and every of these claims each and every one of these allegations stating that you are a zero effluent plant. You continue to say that National Green Tribunal has cleared you as latest 2013, and therefore you are innocent. I think the entire perception in Tutikorin is that uh, since we are the largest plant in Tutikorin, all the ills, all the pollution, everything that uh, can go wrong in Tutikorin is because of us. I think that's a completely wrong perception. And uh, <clears throat> You may know that there are currently around 4,000 megawatts of uh, power plants capacity which has been set up in Tutikorin. And all these 4,000 megawatts of uh, power plants, they use basically coal as a fuel. And coal contains nearly 0.5% to 2.5% of sulfur. And when coal is burnt, sulfur dioxide is emitted into the air. And this sulfur dioxide is sent directly into the air without any capture of the sulfur dioxide by the power plants. Because as of now, power plants are not mandated to have any kind of a system, any flue gas desulfurization system, or any kind of uh, particulate matter uh, you know, mitigation system, etc. So therefore, you'll find that the entire sulfur dioxide actually gets spewed out into the air. On the other hand, if you see sulfur, if you see the sterlite copper installation, we have sulfuric acid plants. We have two sulfuric acid plants which have been in operation. And these sulfuric acid plants, they capture 99.95% of the sulfur dioxide which is emitted from the smelting process. And <clears throat> this entire thing is being captured, converted into sulfuric acid and put into uh, very good uses into the core industry. Absolutely, and fair enough because the report also states that the findings are due to air pollution caused by industries and automobiles. It does not exactly. name you in particular. Exactly. So that's perfectly all right. However, a second allegation has also cropped up, that of the groundwater contamination. And what this clearly says is that, firstly, there was the National Environmental Engineering Research Institute which conducted the research into groundwater in the area. And this began as early as 1998. And the first one said that there was arsenic, psyllium, and lead levels in groundwater which were much higher than prescribed standards. Secondly, it also said that, you know, given the status of the water quality, the TNPCB must exercise care in permitting establishment of any new water-intensive industries in the area. Now, when you claim to be a zero-effluent company, I fail to understand how, very coincidentally, water levels and water contamination levels in and around the area in that your fast factory is established seems to spike. Could you please explain that? Uh, again, I would reiterate here that since inception, we are a zero effluent discharge company. It is part of the conditions of the consent to operate. So therefore, <coughs> as a responsible company, we ensure that we do not waste any water that we use. So what we have done is we have set up three RO plants. The last one was set up, the latest one was set up maybe about three years ago with GE technology. And the entire water that we use is actually reused and put back into the process. 
and we take water from the outside from a desalination uh, unit. 70% of what we need to, what we need additional is taken from this desalination unit and we are dependent only to the extent of 30% from the TWAD board. Then why, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt, but then why did, of course, the Navy report state that the effluent treatment plant was unable to treat the effluent standards stipulated by the Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board within your factory? Well, I think there was something, uh, um, uh, at that point in time, we had two effluent treatment plants. And as I said, the latest one was set up in, uh, in, in uh, about three years ago, mm -hmm. three to four years ago it was set up uh, in GE technology. Mm -hmm. So with that, we have completely uh, set up the kind of capacity that is required mm -hmm. to entirely treat whatever is the water that we uh, use, the reuse in the, in the plant, and then put it back into the process again. And in fact, in 2011, uh, the, NGO, uh, the NGO and uh, Mr. Vaiko, they had visited our plant as part of the NIRI uh, delegation and then they had themselves taken groundwater samples and this was tested and found to be absolutely fine. In fact, I can show you uh, the entire reports of groundwater, what is the baseline of all these marker pollutants like arsenic, iron, fluoride, zinc, etc. versus what is there right now. Uh, in, our, in, our, in, in our plant as well as in and around our plant in all the villages. So if you see all the values are absolutely within, within the limits and these are not our values, these are TNPCB values. Yeah. Because every month yeah. TNPCB sends a delegation and in our presence they take groundwater samples mm -hmm. and they get it tested in the lab mm -hmm. and the reports are given to us and the reports are of course you know, maintained in their records. And yet in 2005 when eight bow wells and two dug wells around the plant were dug up, you know, as far as magnesium, cadmium, copper and selenium levels were concerned, all of these minerals were found to exceed prescribed standards. Why is it so that despite your claiming you're a zero effluent factory, that there is no violation, that you engage in effective effluent treatment, it's coincidental that all of See, this happens I, I in the say, immediate vicinity of your factory itself? I would say that all these matters have already been dealt with in the Supreme Court mm -hmm. in 2013. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court has uh, very clearly said that there may be, have been some deviations as per the NIRI report, but these deviations are not so serious that they cannot be rectified. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court also said that uh, you know the plant, our plant has operated for a certain period of time without a consent to operate. Mm -hmm. And that I can tell you is not because of our issue. Mm -hmm. We have been applying to the for, the for the renewal of the consent to operate every year mm -hmm. and paid the fees uh, to the extent of 15 to 20 lakhs or whatever is the you know fees that uh, TNPCB charges but uh, TNPCB for you know because of their own procedural constraints or whatever they had not renewed it for a period of time so I would say that you know for the fault of TNPCB for not renewing it for not doing uh, their procedural uh, aspect pr properly we have been fined the hundred or rather I would say that we've been asked to deposit hundred crores to take care of any kind of environmental matters that needed to be done in the region. Now thereafter, this 100 crores has been deposited in 2013 with the collector and this has, uh, since then, you know, it is the interest is uh, roughly around 40 crores. Out of this 40 crores, only 4 crores have been spent on roads and not on any kind of environmental aspect. So are we to assume that there was nothing wrong in the environment because of which the TNPC did not find any reason at all to spend the 40 crores. And yet in March 2018 when you, see, when, you, you know, when you sought out consent to reopen and operate the TNPCB put it on stay clearly citing environmental concerns. In 2013 for that Supreme Court order that you, re that you refer to as well a hundred crore fi fine was, was, was you know laid it on. It was a deposit. A, a deposit of course which was subsequently used as funds which you point not out fully, to, to only, the extent of 10%. only an extent of 10% was used. But the fact is each and every one of these rulings of these orders clearly point out to your company being a violator. As I said, the Supreme Court very clearly said that the deviations are not something which cannot be set right. Thereafter, we had the NGT hearing and the NGT had sent, had appointed a very independent committee consisting of the CPCB member secretary, the TNPCB member secretary, two IIT professors. And this committee of four members visited our plant three times. And all these times, you know, they had entirely looked at the entire SOPs, our equipment, etc. And the, in the last visit, we were allowed to operate in their presence. Uh, and then for seven days, the plant was allowed to operate. 
And uh, we said very clearly that we have a system of interlocks whereby if the sulfur dioxide limit exceeds the set limit, the entire plant will come to a standstill. And they said, we don't believe you. And we said, okay, fine, you know, we'll artificially increase the you know, sulfur dioxide content. And uh, immediately, uh, the entire plant came to a standstill. And that is when they believed us. And that is when, based on that report, the NGT gave us the uh, go ahead to go. All right. Two very important concerns continue to exist, though. The first, of course, is the fact that, and this was pointed out by the Madurai bench of the Madras High Court as well, that you got the NGT clearance and the environmental clearance from the Ministry of Environment, rather, without having a public hearing. Your defense was that, considering it's located within, you know, an already assigned industrial complex, a public hearing wouldn't be necessary. But what's important to point out is also the fact that the industrial complex did not exist. It was a proposed expansion for your proposed plant as well. I don't agree with that. Was did the entire industrial complex of Sipcot ex was uh, set up in prior to 2006. And there is an EIA notification which but says very But phase two, of course, was applied for the EIA, the EIA notification very clearly said that any industrial complex which was set up prior to 2006 uh, and any industry which was set up in such an in a industrial complex need not get a public hearing. Now, we were allotted lands based on lands which were acquired pri prior to 2006, and it was part of the Sipcot industrial complex. But technically, sir, the, the phase two of the industrial complex did not exist until it, it, it 2014. Existed. We were given lands before, prior to that. In fact, we were to start this complex, uh, this entire the phase two of our uh, expansion, we were to start sometime in 2009. Mm -hmm. But of course, it also states that it was only in 2014 that Sipcot applied for permission to develop 1,616 acres. So technically, you Sipcot weren't quite allot. You, although you may have been allotted the land, you know, in discussions with the government, the permission to develop it as an industrial complex wasn't obtained until 2014. So technically, there was I, no phase two. I really don't agree with that because you know Sipcot has filed an affidavit to this uh, to this uh, this thing in the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. stating that. The land that was, you know, given to us uh, for the expansion was part of the land which was acquired prior to 2006. We have an affidavit which has been filed by Sipcot in the Supreme Court. So your point of contention is that acquisition of land should be taken as the absolutely. benchmark to whether or not. Absolutely, and there is an affidavit to, 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 to that extent, you know, filed by Sipcot itself in the court. You know, there's also this debate about whether or not you were one of the more responsible companies in the area. 25% of a green belt was the obligation that you had to satisfy, you know, while putting out or running an industry in the red zone, which is of course an extremely high, potentially polluting industry. Uh, data states that you have not complied with that, you know, I think as I said 7. earlier, seven point six percent, as far as the Neely report is concerned, as opposed to twenty five percent, which was the obligation. As I Why? said, as I said earlier, all these points have been dealt with in the Supreme Court in two thousand thirteen, mm -hmm. and these points are being brought about again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So I would like to reiterate it, so to you know, put an end to this aspect mm -hmm. once for all. Mm -hmm. We have developed forty three hectares. Mm -hmm of green belt in our uh, in our entire uh, facility mm -hmm. which is as per the requirement of the MOEF mm -hmm. so it, i think i need to i want to put this to an end we don't want uh, these kind of you know questions to keep coming up mm -hmm. to be uh, you know raked up again and again mm -hmm. by ngos or by various parties so i think we need to go to the supreme court we need to read the supreme court order and uh, f see and register as to what has actually been written out there mm -hmm. all right so in the end, what is the conclusion? Do you feel that this is pretty much an image problem that you are fighting as opposed to a legal one? I would say so. I think there's a lot of misconception which has been brought about by social media, very irresponsible social media, and uh, which I think have uh, brought up very incendiary, incitive you know, uh, messages, and uh, which is absolutely not done. In conversation with P. Ramnath on CNBC TV 18 on the Sterlite copper controversy here in Tamil Nadu and how it has affected both the company's fortunes and the image of industry in Tamil Nadu. Mr. Ramnath, I have to ask you, you know, in the aftermath of the protests and the violence that followed, the one allegation that you have made and continue to make this claim is that it wasn't so much an organic protest as opposed to being engineered by a few elements who had interests, certain interests in mind. Let's set the record straight. Who are these elements that you refer to and what reason could they possibly have? Uh, let me just uh, take you back to 2013, you know, since the NGT hearing. Since then to 2018, in the five years, 
there have been absolutely no complaints from the villages around. There have been no show cause, show cause notices from the Pollution Control Board. And uh, suddenly, in some time in February, the entire thing is, you know, suddenly erupts. And uh, so therefore, and then it erupts into this kind of a violence. So therefore, I think there is obviously an, 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 an element of some kind of a catalyst which has actually come in and uh, thrown the entire thing, you know, out of uh, control. And uh, we've been saying this, uh, that, you know, the locals definitely, you know, would not have this kind of a organization uh, of, you know, having this kind of social media messages going around, so many incendiary messages. So who are these around. individuals that you are laying these allegations on? I don't know whether they are individuals or whether they are a group. Uh, we keep hearing, uh, we get the news only from what we uh, read. We, uh, we read about, about a group, an extremist, you know, leftist group. Uh, called Makkal Adhikaram. So that, from from that, we we ourselves, you know, don't have. We, have, we uh, obviously, you know, we are not a uh, detective agency to do this kind of uh, an operation. So we depend on what what the news puts out, yeah. and then we try to connect the dots. It's interesting you're bringing up the name of that um, leftist group, Makkal Adhikaram, because incidentally, just a couple of weeks ago, two lawyers belonging to that group allegedly, Vanjinathan and uh, Hariharan, were arrested by the police for engineering mm -hmm. these protests, causing arson, causing a number of these, you know, violations of law. Yeah. And uh, a number of, uh, a couple of residents' organizations, a fisherman's organization, has also filed a right. police complaint stating that uh, they were coerced into right. joining the protests. A validation of your claim, perhaps? Yes, I would say so. I would say so. I really cannot vouch that you know these two gentlemen are or belong to that uh, particular group or not. But certainly, if you connect the dots, I would say that uh, probably there is some kind of truth to that. So there is a perception that that a backtracking by a couple of these people, by a couple of groups of these people, of these people, uh, you know, saying that they were coerced, was on account of wanting to get away from all of these, you know. All, all of what was occurring. I, I is there a sense? Is there a sense? And there is a sense, of course, that did you have a role to play in strong arming most of this? Sterlite Copper has absolutely no role in this mm -hmm. because uh, we have nothing to do. You know, we are actually very busy in our own uh, jobs in trying to find out, you know, how to protect our own assets and how to making sure in making sure that you know we try to uh, look at you know how how to you know evacuate the material that is already there in trying to get uh, you know care and maintenance uh, approval so that you know we can go inside get access to our plant so we are busy with our own job you so know there is no copy absolutely strong nothing involved absolutely involved. nothing at all we have nothing to do with that okay you know what's very ironic is just how a few years ago you were invited the global investors meet your plant the extension was proposed to be one of the big ticket investments into the state of tamil nadu and things have changed so quickly ever since the state government that of course invited you its pollution control board has said that you are committing environmental violations. The state government has pretty much made its um, uh, made its bread and butter to ensure that you don't reopen that plant. In fact, they are up against you in the National Green, Tri Green Tribunal as well. Do you think this would have occurred if Jayalalitha was chief minister still? I don't know. I can only say that probably in that time, you know, the law and order situation was much better. So, but I really wouldn't like to comment on the government at all. So, yeah. All right. And what also strikes me as, you know, very interesting is that, you know, in the aftermath of the protests and all that has occurred, um, while there has, of course, been a large-scale allegation against you and the fact that you've come to these environmental violations and subsequent backtracking, you as a company have also ensured that you are using all legal avenues available, be it the court, the, the Madras High Court, the National Green Tribunal. In fact, the Tamil Nadu government has also gone on to state in the National Green Tribunal that you are misusing these legal avenues available to you by using them at multiple, you know, multiple times at a single go. What would your response uh, to these allegations be? Not really. The thing is that, you know, we went to the appellate tribunal because we were, uh, and that was a remedy which was available. Mm -hmm at that point in time when the Pollution Control Board refused to give us the CTO mm -hmm. or re renew the CTO, mm -hmm. uh, that was the only uh, avenue available mm -hmm. uh, because we could not go to the High Court because the first option was the uh, tribunal. Mm -hmm. And thereafter, there have been subsequent uh, orders you know, by the, the closure order and then the closure order by the government. So there was no point in uh, you know, trying to uh, do it at the appellate tribunal. The appellate tribunal did not have any powers to go against the government order and uh, and then we found that uh, the national green tribunal was one uh, you know uh, was one avenue where all these things you know could be dealt with so therefore you know we we uh, we already closed the madurai high court uh, uh, issue 
asking for care and maintenance. And uh, uh, the hearing in the 18th July will uh, come up in the uh, NGT. So based on that, you know, we will uh, take further, further options. Would you reconsider wanting to do more business in Tamil Nadu? No, not really. I mean, we are tied up with Tamil Nadu. We've been here for, for the past, uh, past 20 years. And uh, I think we are one with Tutikorin, I would say that. And one thing, one record I would like to say is that uh, I think there has been uh, some kind of a misconception that uh, there are full of North Indians in uh, Sterlite Copper. I would, like to, I would like to set that record also straight. There are 70% of the employees, which means both direct and indirect employees, mm -hmm. are from Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. And of that, another 70% are from Tutukorin itself. Mm -hmm. So all these protests are putting Tutikorin people out of the job and the Tamil Nadu people out of a job, mainly, majorly. All right. Given the fact that you, of course, have the largest footprint in the area, there is, you know, substantial losses that might occur. But on the topic of losses itself, uh, how much of a loss is Sterlite Industries on account of the closure? What's the hit like? Uh, I would say that rather than uh, focusing on our loss, I would rather focus on the loss for the downstream industries. Sure, and I'm coming to that in just a bit, but as Sterlite Industries, what's the kind of... Sterlite Industries, I mean, uh, uh, we have lost, say, 70,000 uh, tons of uh, copper production in the last two months. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's what it is. But this 70,000 tons uh, goes to the domestic industry and to the exports. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of co copper customers are facing the heat because the copper prices have increased by 5 to 10 percent. And because of this, a number of small uh, producers of, say, um, uh, like, you know, uh, motor producers in Coimbatore, etc., they have shut down because they just cannot take the increase in price. If you were to collate all these losses and put out a number, an approximate ballpark number, if you will, what would that loss number be like? Anywhere, to maybe about 10 to 20,000 crores. And this is with regard to downstream industries as well? Yes, yes. Around your factory. Given the fact that this is, of course, in the courts right now, the case, uh, are you confident of reopening Sterlite Copper? That's what we would like to do. I mean, ultimately, I mean, uh, because we are there in the region and uh, we are committed to Tutikoran and uh, the facts are with us. So I think we are uh, quite confident and uh, certainly, I mean, it may take some time, but uh, we don't know how much time it will take. Mm -hmm. So uh, we require uh, both a, a legal, uh, you know, uh, 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 license to operate plus a social license to operate. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that social license to operate, like you pointed out, could be very crucial exactly. to continuing yeah. business. I have to ask you, looking back, is there anything that you may have done differently or any regrets that you may have had while doing business in Tamil Nadu and Uh I would say that probably we, would, we should have had our ears more to the ground to you know actually pick up the signals and then uh, probably act a little more in advance. So that is something, you know, probably would... Uh, and the other thing is to communicate what the good things that we have done. Probably we should have communicated much better to the uh, people of Tutikorin and uh, also to the, you know, uh, people in Chennai, etc. Do you think your relationship with the government of Tamil Nadu has gone beyond repair, given the fact that they were your partners and now you're pretty much fighting them in court? Is that something that's beyond salvage? No, I... Uh, maybe... I'd, I don't know. I mean, I really wouldn't like to comment upon that. But certainly, I mean, uh, we would uh, want to, you know, have a good relations with the government because obviously we are in uh, Tamil Nadu and... Uh, Intend to stay here? Absolutely, absolutely.